Okay, so I'm going to be talking about thermoregulation in dogs. Um, I'm going to start with the methods of thermoregulation. So there's convection, which is just the transference of heat from the body as air passes over it, um, which is what you kind of see when there's a fan or wind. Um, then you have conduction when the body is in contact with a cooler surface, and that allows heat to be transferred from the animal to that surface. Um, then there's thermal radiation, the natural process of the body releasing heat into the environment, and evaporation, the endothermic process of a fluid changing to a vapor. There's also condensation, which is when a vapor uh, changes to a fluid, but these are the main four that you see with dogs. Um, so then you have the thermal neutral zone, which is just the normal range of temperatures at which a species can maintain their body temperatures without expending energy to increase heat production or heat loss. In dogs, this is um, 68 to 86 degrees Fahrenheit, which is about 20 to 30 degrees Celsius. Um, and then coat thickness and other specific breed or individual properties will affect the upper and lower critical temperature zones for dogs. So some of this stuff later on kind of varies depending on what kind of breed you have. Um, so then when a dog's core body temperature rises far above his um, upper critical temperature, you'll see hypothermia. And some of the symptoms of this is an increased body temperature, severe panting with tongue out. Um, you might also notice that the tongue is dry. There's a lack of awareness of surroundings and depression and lethargy. Um, lying down and won't get up, staggering or appears to be blind, tiny blood clots on gums or in ears, diarrhea, sometimes bloody, weak rapid pulse, decreased capillary refill times, so like if you press down and it takes a while for the color to come back, and then dehydration. Then on the other end, there's hypothermia when the dog's body temperature drops below the lower critical temperature, and those symptoms are like heat seeking or burning in blankets, shivering, weakness, mental depression, shallow breathing, stiff movement, hypotension, lethargy, labored breathing, slow and weak heartbeat, and fixed and dilated pupils. Um, so a couple uh, ways that a dog stays cool. Um, first, dogs only have sweat glands in their foot pads and ear canals, so sweating really is an effective heat loss mechanism for them. And so the major way that they stay cool is through evapor evaporation and panting. The panting increases the evapor evaporation of water across the moist surfaces of their mouth and tongue. And then also when the blood is flowing through their mouth and tongue, it's cooled. Um, and then when it reaches the rest of the body, it kind of helps lower the dog's core temperature. Um, the effectiveness is significantly varied depending on the relative humidity in the air. So if it's really humid, it's not going to be as effective, effective as if there were low humidity. Um, and then when dogs pant, their breathing increases to about 200 to 400 breaths per minute. And they're usually at 30 to 40 breaths per minute, so they increase this a lot to um, help get the air in and out. And then dogs with short faces, like pugs and bulldogs, um, because of the structure of their upper airways, uh, panting isn't as effective with cooling them and it makes it harder for them to tolerate high temperatures. Before you go on, what's the maybe technical term for those short faces? Do you remember? Bre Brachycephalic. Yes. Okay, you had it on. Okay, great. Brachycephalic dog. Freeze. Yes. And then, so some other ways that dogs will stay cool um, is through conduct conduction. So a dog will seek out contact with a cool surface. This is kind of why a lot of the times you'll see your dog laying on the cold ground kind of all sprawled out so that way their stomach is in contact with the ground um, because direct stomach contact is the fastest way for them to effectively cool down through conduction. Um, and then there's also convection and so if the, you have like a fan or something that you can put in front of your dog if it's a hot day that will help keep them cool. Um, and then with radiation, a lot of the time um, when a dog is in hot weather, their blood vessels will dilate so that way the excess heat is carried away from the interior and towards the exterior surface. And so this will allow the heat to radiate from the dog to the environment. 
Um, and so then you also have to think about keeping your dog warm in the winter. Um, a lot of times, um, if your dog is more cold tolerant, they'll have a thicker coat. And um, in the cold weather, they'll kind of increase um, their metabolism and whatnot to help keep their core body temperature up. But there's a few things that you can do to help them. Um, and so either bring your door, dog indoors or provide proper outdoor shelter. Um, and you have to really pay attention to your breed because if you don't have a breed that's uh, tolerant of cold weather, you really shouldn't keep them outdoors. Um, you want to make sure to always provide ample water, whether in the heat or in the cold. Um, another thing, if your dog has a thinner coat, you can purchase a sweater or a raincoat. If it's kind of cold and raining, it'll help keep the water off of them. You can purchase booties, which helps their feet in the cold with their paws. Um, and then if you do have an outdoor dog, if you feed them more frequently in the cold weather, then it'll help their metabolism and keeping their body temperature up. And then if your dog stays indoors in the winter and doesn't really get much exercise, then you should consider feeding them less just since they're not getting this exercise. Um, you want, also wanna make sure to keep your dog at a healthy weight because weight can interfere with thermal regulation. And so obese and overweight dogs will have a harder time regulating their body temperature. Um, you can acclimate your dog. It can take anywhere from like 10 to 60 days so if you do want to have an outdoor dog, just kind of making sure that you're easing them into that new temperature. Um, and then you always want to consider the weather with the temperature and wind and humidity because this can all affect how it actually feels outside. Um, and so then lastly, it's important to note to never leave your pet in a car. Um, so we all hear about to never leave your dog in a car on a hot day. Um, so cars that are in direct sunlight heat up very rapidly and then stay heated um, through, uh, even though there might be a slight ventilation, this is often called the hot house effect. Um, and so the windows allow the sun rays to enter but don't allow the heat waves to exit. And so the interior will heat up very quickly and hold on to that heat. And then the dogs have no way of cooling by conduction because usually the reverse is true because the seats will get hot and everything. Um, and so they'll actually be getting warmer um, and there's no convection because no air movement or radiation. So then they're really reliant on this panting, but it's not very effective for very long, especially when they don't have any water. Um, and so with this diagram, it kind of shows like how quickly a car can heat up. So even if it's just a 70 degree day, which we wouldn't consider to be too hot, it's kind of moderate. Um, in 10 minutes, it can heat up to 89 degrees inside the car, and in 30 minutes, it can heat up to 104 degrees in the car. Um, and so it's very easy for the car to get hot really fast, um, and then for your dog to get out of that uh, thermal neutral zone very quickly. Um, and then it's important to note that cold days um, can be an issue as well. We usually only hear about leaving your, car, your dog in a car on a hot day. Um, but just as the car in hot weather traps in heat, it can also act kind of like a fridge and lock in the cold temperatures. And then again, there's no means of the dog warming themselves through conduction or convection or radiation or anything. And I got a couple comments on the hot days. Um, you know, they, when they're panting and if they've, somebody has just cracked the windows, you know, obviously the temperature goes up like you show, but the humidity in the car also goes up because they're panting and they're exiting moisture. Mm -hmm. And then that's kind of trapped in the car. So two things are happening, higher temperature and then higher humidity. And that means they have less evaporative space. So it's kind of a double whammy. And that chart there, um, and I've done this some summers and I'm gonna do that again. I have like um, a thermometer I can put in my car and it, uh, keeps track of what it's done, but sometimes the temperatures go above, you know, it says like 129 on a 95 day. I think one of my thermometers showed like 130 something yeah. on a hot day and it wasn't even 95 out. So, I mean, that's a good chart for a guideline, but I think they might, those values might even be a little on the conservative mm -hmm. side because I've seen hotter. Yeah. Okay. But yeah, so then those oh, are my there's just at the end too. Excellent. Yeah. And then, 